Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanggang Nama Sahami Welcome, everybody. Um, so I wanted to just begin by inviting people uh, for the rest of, well, give some reflections for 25 minutes or so, uh, and then open things up to questions. Uh, but just invite people, uh, even while I'm up here talking or you're listening to others, uh, to just keep the mind in this heart space. So bringing attention, awareness to this central area, literally where the, the heart is, and just letting that part of the body uh, just stay soft and stay open. And to help yourself stay in that area, you can use this uh, mantra, which we were practicing during the meditation, this Buddha, Buddha, is the Sanskrit and Pali root, which means awakened. And that's what we're trying to do, just to stay awake right here and right now. And one skillful means, in addition to using a syllable, uh, which is this, these particular syllables, Buddha, this is the main mantra of the Thai forest tradition that we practice uh, and we're ordained in. And it's a, a way of practice, which uh, it's my faith, it's my belief that uh, there are some of our senior monastic teachers who've actually attained full enlightenment by just staying with this, this awareness uh, and using these two syllables, Buddha, as a vehicle to take one all the way to full enlightenment, um, complete transcending of greed, anger, and delusion, which sounds really nice. So see if you can just stay here in this, this heart space. Um, earlier this week, uh, something came up for me which comes up maybe once a year. And that was, uh, I was meditating, as we often do as monastics, and towards the end of the meditation, a random thought came up that I haven't thought about for years, and I found it so funny that I actually laughed out loud. And uh, yeah, my meditation doesn't usually get broken up by finding something so funny that I'm able to laugh out loud. But the memory, and I don't know if anybody else is gonna find this funny, um, but the memory was when I was about maybe 10 or 12, there were a number of years, probably four or five years, when my brother and I, he's about three years younger than me, uh, we would basically, we'd be fighting each other, that's what you know, brothers do to one another, and um, we would fight, and his main move would be he would lie down on his back, and he would put his legs up in the air, and he would say, I call on the power of the super kick, woo! And then he would just start <laughs> flailing his legs, and like, what do I do? I can't get within, you know, a leg reach of him, and... Uh, and it really was, and he couldn't really hold it up for that long, but the, the super kick, which he was able to evoke uh, through that, that special, special incantation, it really, it did work, uh, you know, until he ran out of energy. So uh, I hope I'm able to find some way to, uh, yeah, tune that back into what I wanted to talk about today, which is uh, what we chanted over the, the New Year's, which is really a, a way of, invoking the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha, um, bringing to mind and uh, recollecting the triple gem. Um, so most people might not know, um, probably more and more members of this community, people who've come to our events, especially people who came to the New Year's event, uh, what we chanted just before the meditation, we chanted 108 times the Pali version, starting with the Itipiso Bhagava Arahang Sama Sambudo. Uh, and that is nine qualities of the Buddha, 
and then six qualities of the Dhamma, his teaching, which is uh, apparent here and now, timeless, encouraging investigation to be experienced individually by the wise, and then nine more qualities of the Sangha, uh, his enlightened disciples, people who've practiced those teachings and uh, lived them, uh, lived them out, and uh, reciting those again and again. And the origin, one could say, for this uh, protective chant, and in Southeast Asian countries, that's Thailand and Burma, Sri Lanka, and even in Vietnam, uh, people have this memorized, and we'll use it as a protective verse. Uh, it's easy enough to memorize the, the Pali. Um, certainly, you can memorize it in, in any language, or you can totally essentialize it, which is what uh, these different syllables can do. So, Bhutto is really the uh, essential aspect of this quality of the Buddha. It's the, the knowing nature. That's what we can bring. Um, when we take refuge in the Buddha, we, uh, it is uh, a main belief in Theravada Buddhism that the Buddha, Shakyamuni, was a human. He was a human, lived 2,500 years ago in India, and that's amazing that he gave teachings which still live today. But when we take refuge in the Buddha, uh, how to, we're not taking uh, refuge in necessarily a historical person, but more the quality of mind, the qualities of mind, which he really perfected in his life and showed could be perfected, in which we can do today. And right now, just bringing, uh, bringing the mind to a state of balanced, balanced knowing. So Budo is the uh, essential or the concentrated version of this nine-part recollection that the uh, the Buddha is one who is noble and fully self-enlightened. Um, so we can recollect these qualities just with Buddha. Um, the main teaching uh, where this comes from, it's not just a protective verse, but the Buddha used it and uh, would use just exactly these same words again and again and again uh, in different contexts. He said to one of his uh, cousins, Maha Nama, uh, that one can use this recollection of the Buddha, recollection of the Dhamma, recollection of the Sangha in just these exact same words um, to get rid of any kind of uh, obstructive mind state, a mind state which seems to cloud uh, cloud our capacity for knowing clearly. So it comes up there, it comes up in many different places, um, but in one sutta, and this is uh, discourse in the Sangyutta Nikaya, the collected discourses, the 11th Sangyutta about Saka, who's the um, Pali version of Indra, the Hindu god Indra, and it's the third discourse in that collection, so Sangyutta 11.3, um, here the Buddha starts off by giving uh, a background story. He says, Buddha Pubang, which is the Pali equivalent of once upon a time, or uh, once in the past, this occurred. And he lays out this quite fascinating um, account, which you do find elsewhere, but here it's uh, really laid out quite clearly. So he says, Buddha Pubang, once upon a time, uh, when the devas, when the angels were in battle against the asuras. So the asuras are this um, yeah, group of basically uh, giants, um, people who are like titans. Um, and this is a, a motif, or it's something which you find in many different cultures, many different religions. You'll find uh, in ancient Greece, you've got the titans or the giants fighting the, 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 the gods. Um, you find it in Norse mythology. You find it in the Vedas in Hindu. So before Buddhism came about, you hear about the devas fighting the asuras. You find it in Islam even. The, the jinn oftentimes are in battling with uh, devas or celestial, celestial beings. Um, you find it in the Bible. This is the whole story behind Paradise Lost, um, where Lucifer 
and his army of, um, yeah, basically, uh, devils are, are fighting with the, the angels. The fallen angels are fighting with the not, not fallen angels. Uh, Gabriel, Michael. So, yeah, it's something you find in all these different traditions. And in the Pali, along with the Sanskrit, it's the devas who are fighting the asura. And it's mythological, um, but it's also, uh, you find, especially in the Bhagavad Gita, so this is one of the main books of, uh, well, of Hinduism, but also of Advaita Vedanta. Uh, it's probably Gandhi's main go-to book. Um, the Bhagavad Gita, you find talk about that each, each one of us, all humans, have a devai samput. We have a, an angelic nature, parts of us that are angelic or deva-like. Deva literally means that which is, is bright, that which is shining. And we have our asura uh, samput, that aspect of us, which is demonic and, um, yeah, quite powerful in a, a different direction. So we've got the forces of good and the, the forces of brightness and the forces of, uh, of darkness kind of arrayed in battle. And here the Buddha says that Saka or Indra uh, basically says to the, uh, the host, the, uh, his army of devas, he says, it might come about that while you're fighting, you'll have uh, horror or trepidation or... Uh, fear come up. Fear, horror, trepidation might come up. And if that happens, then just look up at my standard. So this is basically a banner. It's like a big stick with a flag on it, uh, like you would see in maybe Civil War reenactments or in Braveheart. So um, yeah, we've got Indra, who's like Mel Gibson, basically saying, and I won't try to do the accent, but basically saying, if you have any fear, horror, trepidation that comes up, just look at my standard and you'll know that I'm here. You'll know that you can trust me. And even if you can't see my standard, look up and you can see the standard of Pajapati, who's another uh, deva, another Hindu um, deity you'll find in the, the Vedas. And if you can't see uh, Pajapadis, then look up at Varuna's standard. And if you look up at Varuna's standard, then your fear and your horror and your trepidation might subside. Or even if you can't see uh, Pajapadis or Varuna's or my own, then look up at Ishina's standard, and then your fear and horror and trepidation will allay. You'll be able to abandon that. And the Buddha says, that might be so. It might be the case that someone looks up, someone in this deva army looks up and sees the, the standard bearer of their different uh, godly, heavenly um, host, their, uh, their leaders, their uh, main gods, and that fear, horror, and trepidation might be allayed. But it might not. And why is that? Because these different gods are not yet fear, the Buddha says, are not yet free, he says, of greed, anger, and delusion. But it is the case that if you go to the root of a tree, or if you go to an empty hut, or if you go to an empty room and you sit down to meditate, it's possible that fear or horror or trepidation might come up. And I would extend that, that you don't need to go to uh, a forest or a scary outdoor place. This can really apply uh, for any time that fear or anxiety come up in daily life. And I would imagine that for um, most people, uh, fear, anxiety comes up, not when we're alone, but when we're in society, when we're going out and we have uh, minor social anxieties come up. We look at someone and we feel that they're looking back through us into our soul somehow, and that's shaking and it's disturbing. And the Buddha said that if any kind of fear, horror, trepidation, this anxiety comes up, whether you're by yourself or if you're in public, then look up to my standard. You can recollect this itipiso bhagava arahang samasambuddho, 
Bija charana sampano sugato loka vidu, Anutaro purisa dhammasarati satta deva manusanang, Buddho bhagavati. That's the recollection of the Buddha that we chanted. Uh, and he said that it is the case that if one recollects the Buddha, this knowing quality, uh, that at that time, that fear and anxiety will be allayed. Uh, why is that? Because the Buddha is free from greed, anger, and delusion. And he continues that that will happen, but if it's not happening right away, then recollect the standard, recollect the flag of the Dhamma. That is, Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Sanditiko Akaliko Ehipasiko Opanaiko Pachatang Veditabo Vinyuhiti. So the Dhamma of the Blessed One is well expounded. It's apparent here and now, timeless, encouraging investigation, uh, leading inwards to be experienced individually by the wise. And this is Dhammo, this is the quality of his teaching, that which is apparent here and now. And what we can do in our practice is more and more tap into that, that place that he's, he's talking about. Uh, recommended for this period now, and really we can go about our, our whole lives, our whole all day, just keeping awareness here in the heart, this heart space. And this is a space of, of knowing, it can be. Um, and it can be a sphere whose center is everywhere and whose surface is nowhere. It's got a circumference which is infinite. Um, so how big can our awareness be? What are the, the boundaries of our, our knowing? And that is one way of practicing with this dhammo, this quality of uh, his teachings, the Buddha's teachings. So buddho and dhammo. Um, and f our fear and terror and uh, horripilation is another word that's used in these suttas. It literally means when our hair is standing on end. Um, if that's not subsiding, our anxieties are not being calmed, then recollect the sangha. This is the, uh, the banner of the arhat. This is sometimes called the, uh, the ochre robes of bhikshus and bhikshunis, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis of monastics from since the time of the Buddha, especially those monastic who have walked the whole path and uh, attained the end of suffering, uh, those who've realized the end of greed, anger, and delusion. Uh, this is supatipano bhagavato savaka sangho, those who have practiced well, who've practiced directly, who've practiced insightfully. This is sangho. This is the essence of uh, our connection with the world. When buddho, that which knows, knows the dhamma and interacts, and that goes into the world, this is sangho, that which connects us with uh, the truth on an external level. Uh, this can help us allay our, our, uh, our greed, anger, and delusion, it says in other suttas, but also our fear, our horror, and our trepidation. So give this, give this a try. Um, this is the Buddha's recommendation for uh, how to get rid of anxiety. And does it require a level of faith? Uh, I don't think it necessarily does. I mean, the words are not English, no one here or anywhere else grew up speaking Pali um, or Sanskrit for that matter. Um, so these are new concepts, but uh, what they're pointing to, uh, awareness, clarity, uh, being here, uh, that which is apparent here and now, that really is uh, not sectarian, it's not religious. And so we can tap into that, uh, this broader knowing, selfless, um, selfless space, this selfless awareness. But if we already have a measure of faith, if these words do mean something to us, if you happen to be so fortunate as to grow up in a Theravada country and um, didn't grow up or end up jaded by uh, too much religiosity, but actually have been able to maintain a level of, of faith and have been seeing beautiful examples of living Dhamma, uh, going and visiting 
monasteries, practice centers, where you do see beautiful examples of uh, people meditating, extremely um, beautiful acts of generosity. Um, if you have grown up with that, then your faith in these different qualities uh, become a strength. The sadha is a faith or confidence. It becomes a bala, a, a strength, something which you can rely on. It's something which gives ballast to your practice. And all of these words, all of the words in this iti piso chant, the more we practice with them and the more you uh, recite them and the more you internalize them and actually make them and figure out how they can have meaning for you. If they sound uh, too foreign, then stick with one of them. Um, or even recite the, the English equivalent, just knowing, awakened, enlightened, that which is here and now. Uh, any of these qualities, whatever brings up faith and brings up a sense of ballast. And if you can start to have confidence that it is possible to develop wholesome states and it is possible to abandon unwholesome states. This is really the essence, the core, the foundation of, of faith in Buddhism, in Theravada Buddhism. Uh, it is possible to abandon unwholesome states. It is possible to cultivate wholesome states. Uh, that is the, the essence of the Dhamma. And from that, okay, if it's possible, then maybe it's possible that someone has actually done that. And that faith, that confidence, that belief, it is a belief. We don't know, even if the Buddha was right here with us, we wouldn't necessarily, or how, how could we know that he had actually put a total end, had totally transcended greed, anger, and delusion. You could see him, and he might be bright. Um, you know, he might be very impressive, but you can't really, uh, most of us can't really know um, the state of someone else's mind. So you have to, at some point, just, oh, is it, is it possible that uh, good habits can be cultivated, bad habits can be abandoned, and that someone in the history of the world um, has been able to fully accomplish that. And not only that, that's the Buddha, but there's a Sangha that anybody can do it. It's, it wasn't just an anomaly that happened 25, 2600 years ago in India. And it's just one Indian guy at that time. But there's a whole Sangha of all sorts of people of all ages attaining the Dhamma, realizing the same enlightenment that the Buddha did fully abandoning greed, anger, and delusion in their own hearts. That's sango. That's sango. And <laughs> these syllables, they're just syllables, but uh, you can imbue them with meaning, and they can become rich. They can become a refuge. They can become a source of ballast and strength for you such that you can evoke them. And they become, you know, it's... The power of the super kick has nothing on the power of the, the triple gym. Uh, they become something which is, is a real refuge and something which you can, you can carry with you. And remember this, just uh, see about this. When fear does come up, uh, and it will come up in your practice, um, fear in the Abhidhamma is one aspect of delusion. It's classed as a type of delusion. In other places, it's classed as a type of aversion. So it's gonna be pretty far along the path until we've put aside all uh, aversion and delusion. Really not until we're, we're our hearts, that is the uh, fully enlightened. So we can keep practicing in this direction and see if we can give these, these words, these concepts, uh, these syllables as just shorthand for that which we uh, we want. All of us want strength and some form of, of weightiness to our practice. Uh, the word garu is literally that which has weight. Uh, and garava is that which we respect. And we nurture this. We nurture this strength anytime we're able to bow to that which is worthy of respect, that which is 
Garava. Um, so you don't have to bow, um, no pressure at all, uh, but it's something that we do in monasteries and in uh, meditation centers just as a skillful means. The, a Buddha statue is a symbol for that which we give weight to. He's a symbol for this Buddha, this knowing. So we have all these different skillful means to uh, practice um, having a refuge and explore this because when fear comes up, it's just so shaking. Fear, that's almost another a synonym for fear. Baya in Pali is chala or chela, that chala, that which shakes. So we need to be able to cultivate and, and be able to see clearly that which doesn't, doesn't shake. And when we cultivate this practice of awareness, uh, it can see, it can know through a measure of shakingness. It's not that you just say this magic word and automatically all your fear and anxiety will disappear, but it does bring about a level of knowing in that which knows fear. Is it possible that that is not fear? That which knows fear is not fear. That which knows anxiety is that, is that anxiety. Um, so yeah, hope everyone can practice these solidifying and grounding qualities and wish everybody the best in your practice. We can open things up to questions. If anybody has a question, uh, I think Kim's got a mic here. And if anyone has a question on Zoom, you can raise your hand. And at some point, if we um, run out of questions or if people are uh, willing, last week, yeah, and people can definitely feel free to, to stand up, uh, go to the restroom, um, or just shift your posture right now. Um, but if people are willing, at some point, last week, we did a guided meditation about recollection of the Buddha, imagining that uh, the Buddha, an enlightened person, the enlightened Buddha just came into our house and imagined what that would be like. And if we have time, I'd love to just hear if anybody did practice that, what, what came up. So, um, looks like, is that Laurent on Zoom? Yes, yes, uh, John, hello. I just wanted to know uh, the difference in the pronunciations between Budo and Buddha or Sangha and Sango. Is there a dif difference in a simple question? Uh, yes, but only grammatically. Um, Budo is the nominative, like I, and Budung is the accusative, like um, mine, uh, like to me. Um, so, and it, and it does just have a, if you're using a mantra to have something that ends in O, like an O sound, Buddha, it just, um, in my experience, in the experience of uh, these Thai Ajans, I think they chose that um, subject case because it uh, somehow works better as a, as a mantra, this O, Buddha ending rather than a Buddha, but really experiment. I mean, there's nothing, it's not inherently magical. Um, there's also the resonance with the tradition. You look up Budo, B-U-D-D-H-O, uh, just look it up on the internet, and every, pretty much every reference you're gonna find is to um, a, someone who's using it as a mantra, um, more than if you just type in B-U-D-D-H-A, and you'll get all sorts of things, so. Thank you, thank you very much. Maybe, is that Brian? You mean on the Zoom? Yeah. Yeah, hi, Ashan Koval. I want to ask you, uh, what do you think is the literal reality of uh, Sakha and the Tabatim Sadevas and the Asuras? Because much of Buddhist cosmology seems we've inherited from people before the Buddha. Yeah, thanks, Brian. That's a good question. Just the reality of these different 
angels, these different gods. Um, Indra is said to be the, um, or Saka is the Pali, the king of the gods. So in a Buddhist, traditional Theravada Buddhist and Mahayana Buddhist uh, cosmology, there are these different heaven realms and different, um, there's not just one god, there's many gods with a lowercase g and many Brahma gods, which you could say have a capital G. But um, yeah, I have no first-hand experience with such, such gods. Um, I came across Buddhism as an adult and was basically introduced and interested in Buddhism because of the meditation and the value that I saw in meditation. Um, and having read suttas, which are all about meditation and about living an ethical life and about how to be generous, I see, oh, these suttas, these are really, there's a lot of value in these ones that I can get my mind around. In this other talk about uh, different realms, it's just less important. I do believe in it on some level, but am I living my every moment of every day as if it was deeply true? Am I, you know, do I, you know, I, um, yeah, that's a question. Um, do I feel like some being is always watching me? Um, and not that gods or devas have to always be watching me, but um, it's just less of an important thing to me. I do believe in it, but I wouldn't say that that's at all fundamental and, um, People start where you're at, and if you don't see any value in that, or if you just can't get your mind around it, no pressure at all. And if you're able to practice for the rest of your life and no faith or interest comes up in those realms, then I don't think it has to be a problem. So, but if it's already in your life, then the Buddha did say that you can have loka dipadaya, you can have these different governing principles so people can um, become ethical or maintain a level of ethics and a level of scrupulosity or a level of conscientiousness in their daily life uh, based on the Dhamma, thinking uh, the Dhamma is true, so therefore I'm going to practice it, I'm going to be generous, I'm going to be ethical. Or you can have your basis of uh, ethics and generosity and mindfulness be a belief in other realms. I believe that uh, there are these other realms and if I uh, act virtuously and am generous and practice meditation, then uh, there's a larger cosmological schema with which that fits in. And although the aim of, ultimate aim of Buddhism is Nibbana, to transcend samsara, uh, there is this framework where heavens do have a place. So a bit of both andism. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Can't totally see on Zoom. Do we have? We've got a question here. I might come back if there's. We'll come back if there's questions on Zoom. Thank you. Hi, Ajahn. This is Scott. Um, I had a more practical question about the metta practice. Um, so when we're doing most of our meditation, it's internal, focusing on stuff inside of ourselves, and it seems like the metta is an expansion training. Is that? On a practical level, is that designed to, uh, can you speak to more about that in terms of like, what is it training us to do and um, what is it developing for us? Does that make sense, my question? It does, it does. Um, it's training an expansive mind. Um, there's a chant in our chanting book, which is the suffusion with the divine abidings. It's on page 43. And it talks about each of the four Brahma Viharas, metta or loving kindness, compassion, uh, sympathetic joy or gladness, and equanimity. And it talks about radiating those. So it talks about basically, um, I believe the Buddha gives a simile of, it's as if you were inside of um, a room with curtains on all four sides and above and below. And it's what you do is basically let the curtain in front of you just roll up, curtain on right side, back side, left side, above and below, around and everywhere. Just let the limitedness of perception just fall away. And a practical way to do that, um, I mean, you can do it through the perception of space, but you can also do it through this practice of, of metta. So do largely speak about trying to be embodied in meditation. So, um, Maybe just a show of hands. When myself or another monk talks about bringing awareness 
into the heart space, knowing, say, from the heart space. Maybe just a show of hands. Who can, f- like, feel what that means? Who does that jive with? Um, and then maybe also just, and no judgment at all, but anybody, uh, does it not work with? You're like, just what are they talking about? Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so, so. Um, so embodiment is important in, in a Buddhist practice, kaya gatasati. The Buddha said, um, there's one practice when developed and cultivated, which will lead to the deathless, lead to Nibbana, and that's mindfulness of the body. So being able to feel inside of the body, feel what it likes, feel what it feels like inside of your hand, to feel um, vibratoryness in your hand, just what does it feel like in your hand right now? Okay, what is it? For me, there's a tingling, a sensation, and if I move my pinky, I feel it moving. There's a correspondence between what's in my mind and when I look down what my hand is actually doing. I'm feeling something which is true on a certain level. So I'm feeling in the hand. You can do that with the heart. Um, and what metta can do, or perception of space, is just where is the boundary? Okay, even if, say, if you can get into that heart space, what it means to feel from the heart. Okay, letting the mind drop down into the the heart. Um, (laughs) You can feel the front. You can feel maybe even your shirt on the front of your chest. You can feel some sense of heat on your back, around the sides. And where does that end? Um, Is it the case that... uh, Basically, awareness just ends at this skin balloon, at this skin bag, or does it feel more fuzzy? And um, exploring that, what what is the limit of my, even my, what seems like my physical awareness? Um, how can the mind be bigger than that? Um, so that's that's the direction. That's one of the directions which uh, loving kindness is pointing to. It makes the mind uh, big. It can make the mind big. Please. Did you want to follow up? So, so basically, if I can kind of encapsulate what you're saying, it's, it's just the, the training of going from the internal to expanding myself to be able to feel more than me, more than myself and becoming connected with the greater universe as far as I can imagine that? Um, Yes, but I think for most people, (laughs) it doesn't go all the way out to the universe. It's like, I can feel, you know, I don't feel a boundary, you know, where I stop and the world begins, but I'm also not feeling Saturn right now. You know, I'm not, I'm not even feeling necessarily the people who are right in front of me but just letting down this sense of boundary. So the sense of infinite, sometimes people talk about infinite space or infinite loving kindness. And that just is unrealistic for most people, but a boundless loving kindness is something which we can hopefully incline towards. So, so just expansive feeling is, is, is basic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and that's what, that's, what love, that's what loving kindness is. That's what metta is, is just uh, breadth and expansiveness and softness and its softness. So, um, I think Samek. Um, with regard to fear um, in Dhamma, what skillful means in communicating that to people who don't practice? Suppose, like, you have fear um, with regard to what you saw with practice and you're freaking out and like what's a skillful way to communicate that with people who don't understand um, who like if I try to try to explain something that's hard to say it's like you sound crazy (laughs) but at the same time it's like it feels like I want support in a way in overcoming that if that makes sense yeah so how to speak about relating to fear with someone who maybe doesn't have any kind of dhamma roots or anything. Yeah. I think embodiment is really helpful. And I would say with these 
uh, more agitating emotions, like the more airy emotions, that's those which have that chala, that kind of vibratory nature with them, uh, restlessness, anxiety, worry, fear. I would suggest um, actually starting and more emphasizing the embodied, embodiedness rather than you know, ex, uh, expanding, because fear is already um, quite shaken. Your, um, your mind is spun out into whatever it is that you think is gonna, gonna harm you. And so, especially like the, the core region, so if, if someone can have the mindfulness to just keep, bring the mind back into the, uh, the core area, the, the belly, to come back into the belly. I mean, that's, it's just a way of grounding one's awareness um, that, yeah, keeps one from spinning out. Um, like, would that mean to not communicate or try to communicate with, I guess, like people who don't? Because I was, uh, more so the question was like, suppose you're in that state of like fear um, after like an intense meditation and, or like day to day, you accidentally meditate or something. And then you're like, around people who don't understand and you like want to communicate something like what skillful means in communicating the experience you're currently going through yeah it is of course important to have spiritual friends um, and also to um, you know if you can choose the people who you go to uh, at such times wisely I mean you want someone who's grounded themselves like if you're feeling shaky um, if you're able to uh, even listening to a Dhamma talk that's uh, maybe even Ajahn Jeff I mean his voice is just so low that it almost just you know grounds you just just hearing his his voice um, so yeah having deep voiced friends is good um, <laughs> but yeah cho choosing who you talk to um, and if you feel like talking with someone's just gonna spin you out more or make you more self-conscious uh, or worried, then yeah, seeing if there are other friends. I mean, our Discord group is quite um, alive and hopefully making friends there and just people here, you know, everyone has interest in trying to have a level of stability to the mind and to even care what that means and be inclining in that direction. So I would encourage, um, yeah, speaking to people um, when you're there, but also staying, staying embodied if you can. Thank you. So I, I wanted to expand more on, I think, Scott's question about this expansiveness, right? So this idea of, like you said, um, like expanding awareness, do you, when you say that, do you mean that in a visceral sense, or do you mean that in a side? Or sorry, you said about uh, uh, breaking, or the, the, you have a boundary. You want kind of want to break that. Something you said something along those lines. Do you mean that sort of in a visceral sense, or do you mean that in a more psychological sense, as in um, like I can touch myself, right? That's a boundary, or, or or do you mean that in a more abstract psychological sense? Somewhere in between. Somewhere in between. You know, I'm not necessarily saying that. You know, I put my hand up and you, you know, put your iPhone with a certain, you know, number or color on it. And I'm not going to be able to say that's a red 13 or, you know, something like that. Uh, but um, somewhere in between, like when you just feel, <laughs> you feel your hand or you feel a part of your body. Um, for me, and maybe other people are different. Um, but it, it just feels like a fog of sensation. Like th there's a tingling on the surface of the skin. It seems like, where does it end? I don't know. You know, I can see the edge of my skin. Okay, there's me, and there's not me. There's my skin, and there's you know, the floor, air over there. Um, but when you actually feel into the body, uh, it doesn't feel like it has a boundary. And almost playing with that playing in that space um, and because of that um, sort of psychological um, sort of uh, 
yeah, perceptual and actual mm. uh, liminal ground. Yeah, you can play with it and see what it feels like to expand awareness from there. Yeah. I think we've got a couple people on Zoom, maybe. What's that? Oh, Eric and Nati. Hello, Ajahn. Uh, thank you. Um, I actually want to preface first, this is actually my only uh, second time here, so I'm really excited to be here, and it's my second time with anything Theravada at all, ever, um, so I'm really grateful. I come from, an, it was actually funny with this talk, I come from a Nichiren Shu practice otherwise, which kind of the familiarity of chanting and syllables and kind of those as objects of contemplation, it was really, it felt very meaningful to have that kind of speaking to me in this talk. Um, my question, it was actually funny how appropriate everything has been because between the hierarchy of needs talk and this one, I was actually um, laid off from uh, my job of like almost two years, kind of going through a bit of um, more troubles than kind of speaking of fears and anxieties than I've been in a while. Um, so my question, what I've kind of been doing a lot, I've noticed is I'll do things where I'll kind of act optimistic, act positive, try and live out those values more in the way that I'll talk to kind of convince myself, others, my family members, my co my ex coworkers, kind of saying how fine I am, how optimistic I am, how grateful I am, kind of all of these things that kind of do connect with the, the, you know, the Budo, the Dhammo, and the Sangha in my mind, but it kind of feels like I'm faking it on some level. So it's kind of like, how do you deal with feeling like you're kind of faking that optimism when in reality, it's like, I still have a lot of anger that is towards the people who let me go. And I have a lot of anxiety and fear towards kind of the future of where I'm going to be. So those are still there. Like, how do I kind of deal with those more holistically instead of just on that surface level, if that makes sense? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it points to um, that buddho or awareness, how big, how big can that be? I mean, something about that simile where you say the Buddha, um, you can almost look up to the standard of the Buddha, um, his, uh, this dajaga, the, the crest of the banner. Um, and the simile, the metaphor there is almost an external one. Um, I won't push the implications of that, but um, I think it's fair to say that there's more to the mind than can be conceived of in our, our fantasies. Um, so the mind is bigger than we think, but not trying to uh, fake anything, not trying to think pink or um, just pretend like something doesn't exist. And if there are uh, aversive or angry um, disgruntled thoughts, Budo awareness can know that. It's bigger than that. It can uh, encompass all of that, but it's not that. Um, so you can, you don't have to be afraid of, um, of those emotions. You can, can know them, especially the more grounded and rooted you are um, in this, the qualities of Budo, Dhammo, Sango. Um, <laughs> and on a, a, a some level, just those quick means, those syllables, um, it can be a short note. You say the syllable and it brings you back to the place uh, of knowing. And that can be, it's bigger. It's bigger than your aversion. Um, and it's bigger than all of my um, petty and small but real um, emotions. So yeah, keep, keep practicing and let your budo be big.